Welcome to Temple Talk. I'm the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim and Richmond here together. It's so grooving today. The second day of the month of Shabbat. 5779, the Shabbat Parshat Bo. Today is January 8th, 2019. And this is such an exciting Torah portion. It is the conclusion of the makot, the strikes, the plagues that were visited upon Pharaoh in Egypt, and it is the beginning of the redemption. It's time, time to leave Egypt. That's what we'll be studying about this Shabbat. And we have begun a new month, and while every month has its own particular character, challenges, uh, propensity towards various aspects of tikkun, of self-improvement and of improving the world, this particular month, the month of Shvat, is very special because if every month is a unique time for new beginnings, then Shvat, that's the whole theme of the month. Because the month is is really um, epitomized by its its crescendo, which takes place on the fifteenth of the month, Tubishvat, which will be celebrated this year on the twenty first day of January, and Tubishvat, the fifteenth day of the month of Shvat, is the new year of trees, and it is a time of special divine energy that resonates within all of creation, and it powers this month. This whole month, really, is, uh, is all about growth and new beginnings, and that's the force that comes to a crescendo on Tu really. And it is about um, potential for all of us to start all over again. And um, it's a harbinger. Hard G or soft G? Har- harbinger. Harbinger hard G, hard G. Of, of spring. So. And here we are in the rainiest winter in, I believe, 30 years on record. It's been quite rainy and it's quite cold now. It's quite cold and may these be rains of blessing. Amen. And sleep tomorrow, they're saying. Graupel in Hebrew. (laughs) That's not Hebrew, my friend. (laughs) It's called Hebrew. Sleep tomorrow. And, um, you know, something else that's very special about this month of Shvat, and that is, what, Yitzchak? Do you remember? Do I remember what? What else is special about this month of Shvat? I'll give you a hint. This month of Shvat. It is mentioned by name, practically, in the very beginning of the fifth book of the Torah. When we read when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moshe began his ah. soliloquy of gentle rebuke and a review of the mitzvot to the Jewish people before taking his leave of them, he began to speak. It's actually verse 3 of chapter 1 of the book of Devarim. It was in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first of the month, when Moshe spoke to the children of Israel according to everything that Hashem commanded him to them. So the idea the verse is telling us is that Moshe began to recite, really, to teach the book of Devarim on the new moon of Shvat, Mm -hmm. which was just this week. And he spoke for 37 days. Until his passing to the next world, the seventh day of Adar. The idea being that uh, when we talk about newness, when we talk about reconnecting, and when we talk about uh, a new beginning and the illusion of Tu really, to the um, potential for all of us to start all over again, and of course, the, the, you know, and we'll talk more about this as Tu Bishvat draws nearer in two weeks from yesterday. The verse in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 19 that says, Is the tree of the field a man? Rhetorically asking that there is a comparison between a person and a tree. But the idea is, <clears throat> when we talk about this potential for newness, it's up to each person to seek this um, relationship. To, to strive all the time to awaken a, n- a new inspiration and energy for serving God. And that is a partner concept ha- going hand in hand with the fact that this month began Moshe's recitation of the Book of Devarim to the people of Israel immediately before his death, right? And the idea is that, and of course he was preparing them for entering into the land, mm-hmm. 
gently, gently chastising, blessing them, preparing them to inherit the land. But it is a time that is e exemplary of Torah study and knowledge. It's like, you know, the, the, the um, symbol, the constellation, the symbol of the, the month is the bucket, mm -hmm. Aquarius. Deli. The Deli in Hebrew. The idea being that that is pouring down on us, that, that knowledge of Torah this month, and it is so close to us uh, for us to receive if we are willing to make the effort. So there's something that's very um, predisposed this month for, uh, beginning this month for um, an acquisition of, of Torah knowledge and, and, and deepening and enriching our relationship with Hashem. The dead of winter, nights are long, if you weren't living in an agrarian society, you're not outside uh, uh, tending to your crops because you're not in the field yet. So there's more time for study. That's one way to look at it. Yitzchak Parashat Bo. Things are heating up in Egypt. Last three plagues. Things come to a head in Egypt. Uh, come down to the wire. And one of the amazing things about this week's Torah portion, of course, is uh, sudden appearance of the Passover offering, the interruption of the narrative of the of the plagues with uh, everything that begins in chapter 12, which it's is... It's not really so sudden, though. Because from the very start, Moshe said to Paro, let my people go that they may serve me. And he said, what did he want? They want to do a korban. They want to make an offering in the desert for three days and come back. Very modest. S but the idea of making an offering was, that was what this avodah, this, Ostensibly, this, this right. serving God, was, was this korban Pesach, this uh, Passover offering, which apparently was so such an outrageous, uh, such an outrageous request, demand, that even to allow the people, even just the adults, because Moshe, we also learn about Moshe, that he started out very reluctant to take on this whole job, and he, and he stuttered, and he wasn't sure of himself, and he, he, how's, he gonna, how's Pharaoh going to listen to him of all people? He turns out to be, he grows quite sure of himself. And sure. Quite articulate. That's what I was just saying. The, the whole idea about the beginning of Shvat is that it marks the beginning of, you know, um, 40 years later, 30, yeah. 39 years later, 37 years later, mm -hmm. of, of Moshe's recitation of the Book of Devarim. So considering that he described himself as a person that can't talk, he had a lot to say. Yes. But that's part of the, of the whole secret of the transformative nature of Torah as well. Because mm -hmm. Moshe, of course, represents the whole, he's the whole embodiment of the, of the repository of Torah knowledge. And everybody knows the goal of, of study to bring us closer to Hashem, to make a deeper soul level acquisition is not just the, to amass information, but to change. But one thing that astounds me, I really was focused on this year, is mm -hmm. that the idea is not to go out into the desert for three days uh, in order to do a Shabbaton, in order to observe the Shabbat, in order to put on tefillin, in order to receive the Ten Commandments, none of these other things simply to do a korban, to make an offering which is as old as humanity itself. And it has been man's primal and prime and primordial connection, uh, a means of communicating with, with, with God, with Hashem, since the days of Adam. And I think that is what threatened Pharaoh so much. The Pharaoh was a he was an imposter. He was a fraud. He was a fake. You a know, usurper. A pretender. A usurper. A usurper. He was trying to take to yes. take over the 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 and, role of. And he wasn't afraid of some you know new highfalutin something new in the world. He was afraid that people were waking up to the fact that there is a god in this world, one god, and that his name wasn't Pharaoh, and uh, that was the big threat. And that's why, no matter. You know how that, that's how he tried to thing. manipulate. He just couldn't. He could not accept that. Whether it was for three days or with with children, without children, with livestock, without livestock, he could not accept it. 
He cannot accept the Hashemness of right, it at all. Right. That's the whole thing about about this entire epic saga from beginning to end that, w- that we tried to speak about already last week. The whole idea of the purpose of everything that's going on here, as Hashem says here, so remarkably in this verse in the beginning of Parshat Bo, Hashem said to Moshe, "Come to Pharaoh, for I have made his heart, his heart, and the heart of his servants stubborn." Art scroll translation, so that I can put these signs of mine in his midst, and so that you may relate in the ears of your son and your son's son that I made a mockery of Egypt, and that my signs that I placed among, and that and my signs that I placed among them, that you may know that I am Hashem. This whole thing boils down to Hashem versus Pharaoh consciousness. The, everything that's going on here was always from the very beginning, as as I mentioned last week, just about the knowledge of Hashem as opposed to the denial of Hashem, which mm-hmm. is what you just mentioned. And f- and over and over again, we we, we read uh, in last week's Torah portion as well, this is all about knowing that I'm Hashem. And here too, it's all so that you may know that I am Hashem. But you see, you see, this is giveaway here also. This is, this is really interesting here. What the verse is telling us is not... So that he'll know that I'm, that I'm Hashem, mm-hmm. but that you'll know that I'm Hashem. V'yedatem ki'ani Hashem, right? So, so the whole underlying principle of emuna, of belief in Hashem, it is hinging upon the 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 um, spiraling, magnificent, sprawling idea of the Egyptian exile and redemption. That is the basis of everything. That is, like we mentioned last week, again, one of the one of the six remembrances, one mm-hmm. of the constant mitzvot. I mean, here in this week's Torah portion, we have suddenly introduced into this the mitzvah of tefillin. Mm-hmm. Right. The commandment of tefillin is mentioned here in our parsha as it's as being connected to commemorating the, the, the to uh, Yitzhak Mitzrayim, to the exodus from Egypt, right? And it shall be uh, a sign upon your arm and an, and an ornament between your eyes, verse 16 of chapter 13. For with a strong hand Hashem removed us from Egypt. And indeed, according to the sages, one of the kavanot, one of the major intentions that a person has to have every moment that he's wearing the tefillin is that Hashem took us out of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. That is everywhere, and that is the irrefutable, undeniable um, sign, proof, whatever, that, that not only did God create the world, but God embraces the world and God conducts it, uh, orchestrates everything. And as people say, you know, so often, uh, you know, we don't see any miracles anymore and we don't, and we don't uh, have the kind of relationship that we had in those days and Hashem doesn't manifest himself as he did. And, and But if you understand the underlying principle of what's going on here, that this is the, the um, demonstration of Hashem's mastery over and control over nature, and the forces of denial in the world, and the f- uh, versus the forces of emuna. So, again, uh, where I'm going with this, every th- everything that's been mentioned until now is indicative of the fact that the purpose of of the, of the entire experience of the visitation of the planet, I'm not talking yet about the makat b'chorot. That's a different thing. Mm-hmm. The killing of the firstborn is in its own category, and it's a very, very different thing. It's a very um, uh, it, does, it doesn't fit in with any of the templates so far of what's been going on with the plagues. And yet, it's, we knew about it from the very beginning, because in the very yes, beginning... God just gave uh, it away, spoiler. Uh, yes, in the very, very beginning, um, uh, that was the first warning to Paro, was that right. if you don't let them go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smite your firstborn. It's, yeah. it's crazy. So like, why? it's not even a surprise. So then why, what was all this leading up to it? So everything that's going on, by, by the way, I want to tell you I'm very excited about this week's video lesson, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, that we're going to be uh, doing on this week's Torah portion because I want to explore a little bit deeper the concept of the slaying of the firstborn. Like, what is that? And and where does it come from? And why? Why the firstborn? And who were they exactly? And specifically, I want to explore in our, in our video teaching, Torah teaching this week, the connection 
between what I think are the two major themes, which are really one concept of this week's Torah portion, Parashat Bo, the slaying of the firstborn and the Korban Pesach. I think they are irrevocably and intimately um, connected. But like I said, that's another story. This is just a little teaser here, but not a spoiler. So I'm saying everything here about the, um, the makot, the plagues that were visited upon Pharaoh in Egypt, were, 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 was about knowledge, about understanding, about seeing, about knowing that Hashem is, is God. But here, we're told that the major aspect of what we have to educate our children and our grandchildren for all generations, right, so that you may relate in the ears of your son and your son's son that I made a mockery of Egypt, that I stood Egypt on its head, that I played, is the word in Hebrew, that I that I poked fun at, it. that's mm-hmm. the, the mo- in modern Hebrew, of Egypt, who was in total denial that I even exist, right? And my signs that I placed among them that you may know that I am Hashem. And that, my friend, Yitzchak, I think ties in very, very um, deeply with a, with a very um, difficult uh, kind of teaching of our sages that at the time that the, that the Israelites were uh, about to be redeemed from Egypt, they were also pretty far gone. Mm-hmm. They were pr- they were pretty sunken in the in the influence of their pagan environment, and there's mm-hmm. one midrash that says that there was a there was a ketrog, there was a an adversarial opinion expressed amongst the angels. Again, this is all metaphor, that said, "What do you mean these these are idol worshippers and these are idol worshippers? Why are you re- why are you redeeming Israel?" And the and the acid test, the mivchan, the the uh, the test that we passed as a nation in this formative phase in the crucible of Egypt was a test of Emunah. And mm-hmm. this goes hand in hand with the concept of the blood that was placed over the doorpost. Yes. And the question that's asked by so many of the, of the great authorities, what, Hashem needed a road map? Like Hashem, in the one hand, Hashem himself is saying that he himself is going to be passing over the houses. So like... So like uh, he didn't have ways, he didn't have GPS, right. he didn't have Google Maps. So like you have to what well, he doesn't know where they all live. But the idea is that the, that the blood on the doorposts was on the inside because it wasn't for Hashem to see, it wasn't for the Egyptians to see, it was for the Jews themselves to see. That's why again this whole concept of the Korban Pesach is so incredibly, astoundingly deep, because it was the ultimate step of total faith in in Hashem that they were expressing and their and their uh, allegiance and alliance to him. That's why we've always defined the Passover offering, which by the way, this very week, uh, two days ago here in Jerusalem, there was actually a conference in the Temple Institute. It's becoming a yearly event. It was a very, very scholarly um, event, symposium on various aspects of the practicality of the renewal of the Passover offering in our day. It's the, it's We've called it the national circumcision of the people of Israel, which is really a perfect metaphor because the circumcision and Passover offering, the two different types of blood that are mentioned in the verse in Ezekiel, they are one and the same. They are of the same level of seriousness in terms of their their um, irrevocable um, identification with the with the very root of who Israel is as a nation, express, ex- as an expression of faith, entering into the covenant of Avram. And again, the, the korban Pesach is so reminiscent of of uh, Akida Yitzchak, of the binding of of Isaac. In that, in that, Avraham was was as it were, you know, commanded to to make an offering of his wasn't his it was his firstborn by Sar. It was his firstborn, and and. Uh, you know, Hashem, the the angel of Hashem appeared at the at the crucial moment, and and Avraham understood that uh, he was to bring a lamb instead of his son. And the same thing here with with the, the Exodus from Egypt. Uh, the choice is basically your firstborn or a lamb. Uh, who whose side are you on, Pharaoh or? Or, th- or, th- this, or this, this whole event is an, is a seminal event, not only in Jewish history, but in but in human history, because it was the the total demonstration of the existence of Hashem before the whole world. That's why, even as we've said many times, even on Kiddush, that we make the the uh, sanctification over the wine in uh, to to announce the sanctity of Shabbat. 
we say that Shabbat itself, which of course preceded the, the Exodus from Egypt, Shabbat of creation, is in itself a, re a remembrance mm -hmm. of the Exodus from Egypt because it was like a whole new creation because the whole world was able to was able to uh, witness that. And, that, and that's the idea of the, of the sages uh, totally emphasizing integral that. integral part of creation. That's the idea of the sages emphasizing that. For example, when the, uh, the sea split, the Sea of Reeds split, and Israel crossed it, everybody in the wor of water in the world split. Mm -hmm. And that's also metaphorical. Whether or not that's literal, the idea is that the entire world knew what was going on and that this nation of Israel was born. So I was saying that the whole, the whole bottom line here is about emunah. It's about, it, which is the opposite of Pharaoh, this, the opposite of the, of the whole realm of denial. And that's why this verse tells us in the beginning of the parasha, so that you may know that I am Hashem. Because this was about, it wasn't just about leaving Egypt. It was about leaving the Egyptian bis inside each and every one of us mm -hmm. behind also. That, and of course, we know that the, there were a lot of Israelites that did not make it out of Egypt because they were not ready to make that step. And that's what happened during the plague of darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very uh, alarming figure that, that actually had the fortitude uh, to leave. It was like one-fifth of all the Jews that were actually there. And the others apparently felt that the Egypt is the place to stay. Yep. So... This definition of emunah, of, of faith, belief, whatever that you're describing is not, you know, sometimes we think emunah means believing in what you can't see, you know. But you're saying it, believing in what's right in front of your eyes, believing in the reality that God and, is, and, and, is and also showing and what's, us. It's what I started to say about how people say it today, oh, we don't see these kind of things today. It's about the emunah, about what I have inside me as well, my mm -hmm. own personal conviction and my own knowledge that this is true. It's knowing that Hashem is in the world and opening your eyes to it as, as opposed to... It's the same battle. Nothing's changed. The same battle that we see being waged on every front in the world today, the battle between denial and self-promotion, uh, self-gratification, uh, the pumping up of the self, which is everything that Pharaoh was all about, and the idea that there's really Hashem in the world who uh, is uh, the purpose of creation, is that knowledge is just understanding that He's God and that... That's the basis of it. There's the music. These halves are much too short. I can't believe we finished the first half of it. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. and welcome back to the Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin with Rabbi Chaim Richmond here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the second day of the month of Shvat 5779, the 8th of January 2019. This week we are reading Parashat Bo. Go to Pharaoh, God tells Moshe. And we've been talking about the aspect of the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering. We're talking about emunah, faith, knowledge in God's being and God's existence and God's constant interaction and concern with the world as opposed to the pharaonic uh, take on life which is I me mine it's all about me I am God because I'm the only reality in the world and I don't know of this God that you're talking about Moshe it means nothing to me so there's a showdown here and God as you pointed out earlier Rabbi basically mops the floor with Pharaoh he he makes a, 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 a laughing stock of him. He, he turns him into a punching bag. Uh, it almost seems like gratuitous, you know, like, why? Why go so far, God? But as you said, God wasn't interested in, in, in mocking Pharaoh or Egypt for Pharaoh's sake or Egypt's sake, but for the sake of everyone else that they know that there's a God in the world and that there's only one God in the world. And to some extent, that, that showdown that you describe is going on within each and every one of us all the time. Yes, very and, much so. And uh, again, that, that, that according to, uh, it's not so simple, the idea about the, the blood on the doorpost, but according to the opinion that it was on the inside, the whole idea is that 
that was the ultimate uh, disconnect and disassociation that we needed from idolatry. And um, it was um, the turning point, really, because it, it, was, it was a demonstration of this emuna. That's really what it was. And this is why we have to know that, uh, as, again, I just can't get past that, that uh, verse in the very beginning of the parsha, um, so that you may know that I am Hashem. Everything changed with um, the exodus from Egypt and with everything that led up in, until then. Another aspect, something new in this week's parsha, which is right before the commandment to do the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, is the commandment that this is the first of your months, that from now on, Israel, you will be calibrating and designating the months. You will be in control of your own time, in control of your own right. destiny. Two aspects, and, really. And, and I want to say that this also is another connection, I think a very, very deep connection to creation. We said before that, you know, we, we Shabbat is... is uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a testimony to God creating the world and also to the exodus of, from Egypt and that this commandment to take over time, to take, to take responsibility for time is basically bringing us back to the, to the start of creation because time was the beginning, because time, creation was the beginning of time. And this brings us all the way back. Uh, and again, we are we become real partners with Hashem. It's it's more than taking responsibility. It's literally taking control of time mm -hmm. because it's the Beit Din, the court, that establishes Rosh Chodesh. And if they make a mistake, the, the our sages teach that Hashem says, "I'll go along with you. It's up to you. You it, it's in your hands because it has to be done on earth because the Torah is not in heaven." major principle. Now, now the thing is, you know, first of all, it's incredible. The, uh, the two aspects to this, what we read about in the beginning of chapter 12, there's Rosh Chodesh itself, the, the, the concept of the renewal of time, and Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which mm -hmm. is the head of the month, the first of the month, Nisan, the time that we left Egypt. The very fact that this took place in Egypt, in the heart of darkness, as it were, paraphrase Conrad, <laughs> The very fact that this is the first collective commandment that was given to the nation of Israel, which wasn't even really practically, could be said to be a nation yet, but that even though the Torah had not yet been given, the first thing that Hashem has to say to us while we're still in Egypt is, you need to take control of time. You need to sanctify um, this month and to, in general to sanctify time. I want to tell you something now, Yitzchak. Open up your heart in the very deepest way possible. Open. Let me know. Wait, you open it so quickly? It's open. That's always It's always open. open. All right. Always open for you. What this really means on the deepest level, this is another aspect of freedom. And this is not just another detail. It's not just, uh, oh, by the way, uh, while we were in Egypt, before we left, we're about to, right, right, right about to leave uh, Egypt and everything, and all this is going on around us, the plagues and everything like that. Korban Pesach now slaying the firstborn. Hashem says, by the way, don't forget to sanctify time. No, that's not what this is all about. What it, all, what it is all about is that one of the major types of slavery is slavery to time. Mm -hmm. One of the major problems that we suffer from in the human condition is, and I don't just mean by this falling into rote or complacency, I mean we become victims of of time and the Torah commands us to rise above the limitations of time and that's really the secret and the foundation of the calendar it's the secret of, of getting up every day as a new creation uh, with total renewal it's a secret certainly this month of Shabbat it's a secret of Nisan it's a secret every week of Shabbat when we learn that Hashem originally only created the world with enough enough uh, staying power for six days and and that Shabbat every week comes and breathes new life into all of creation like the neshama of all of creation it's the the Jewish mind mindset con conceptualization of time is completely different than anything else that exists 
And it's so perfectly fitting, it's just breathtaking how apropos it is that here in the midst of, of, of this demonstration of Emuna that's going in the midst of this showdown in, in the darkness of Egypt, in Parshat Bo, all of a sudden, as uh, Moshe said, you know, so said Hashem, at, at about midnight I shall go out in the midst of Egypt, every firstborn on the land of Egypt, and this is all about to have Hashem said to Moshe, he's not going to listen to you, so that my wonders, again, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt, right? So Moshe and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but Hashem strengthened the heart of Pharaoh. He did not send out the children of Israel from his land. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have a completely different topic, Rosh Chodesh, and the sanctification of time, and that Nisan shall be the first of the months of the year, and then the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, and all its detailed laws. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 20, 12 and, 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 and verse 29, we get back to the uh, slaying of the firstborn, right? For first we read, the children of Israel went and did as Hashem commanded Moshe and Aaron. So did they do everything about the Korban Pesach. And while they're, they're dealing and eating with the Passover offering, we have the slaying of the firstborns, about which actually in the verses of the Torah, there's so little that's said. It was at, at midnight that Hashem smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and every firstborn animal. Pharaoh rose up at midnight, he and all his servants and all Egypt, and there was a great outcry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was no corpse. He called to Moshe and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, go out from among my people, even you, even the children of Israel, go and serve Hashem as you have spoken. Take even your sheep and even your cattle as you have spoken, and go and bless me as well. Uh, that's it. Three verses mm -hmm. about about Makat B'chorot. And, and by the way, I just want to say as an aside, if you notice in chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are. When I shall see the blood and I shall pass over you, there shall not be a plague of destruction upon you when I strike in the land of Egypt. And we spoke earlier about the the question, a very famous question, a very obvious question, why does Hashem need to know which houses they are? But here it's described as a as a negef um, lemashchit, should not be a plague to destroy. And there's a whole question amongst the sages. Was it Hashem himself that did this, or was it an emissary? And so, you know, there's this idea. Here the verse tells us that there wasn't a house where there wasn't uh, a corpse. Mm -hmm. But why should that be? Not everybody is a firstborn. Mm -hmm. There's an elder daughter. There's all sorts of circumstances in which there is no firstborn. So you know that there is a very famous opinion that in a house where there was no firstborn, the oldest in the house was considered the firstborn. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell you that there's a very interesting um, discourse, a very interesting scholarly discourse among some scholars who maintain this distinction, that when it came to a house where there was an actual firstborn, it was Hashem himself. But when it came to a house where there was a surrogate firstborn, mm -hmm. a stand-in firstborn, just due to his rank in the house, that was a malach, an angel of destruction. And that's how the, this contradiction in the verses mm -hmm. is, sometimes, is sometimes addressed. In any event, in any event. it was quite a scene. In any event, I'd also like to add that before you can do the Korban Pesach, you need to have control of time. You need to be able to be in control of, of your own actions, which the, one of the main definitions of, of enslavement is to not be in control of your own schedule, not be in control of, of when you get up in the morning, when you, when you, uh, you know, uh, go to work, when you come home, when you, when you eat, when you do anything. Pharaoh had control, total control of the time of the Israelites, and the first and that's a type of psychological the warfare. Yeah, the, the first bond that you break is that of time. And, and if you control time and you really, you know, have it under your belt and you really are in charge of it, you cannot be enslaved. And so, again, the, it fits in so perfectly here. And I want to even, I, wanna, I want to um, sharpen the idea even more because I, I was explaining it in terms of being, in, you know, the, pos the problem of a person being enslaved to time, and you're demonstrating how Pharaoh actually used time as an element of enslavement. But what the really Torah is really emphasizing to us here in the positive commandments that we find in the beginning of chapter 12 of sanctifying the new moon and, and of starting the calendar 
you and I have always described it as like this is the beginning of time, right? That, this, mm-hmm. that here we're reading in this week's Torah portion of Bo, about the beginning of time. How could that be if Hashem created the world back in Breshit and, and he placed the luminaries in the sky and right. there were six days of creation and Shabbat? Yes, but the idea is that it wasn't, it wasn't something that was measurable. Mm-hmm. It wasn't something that we sanctified. It wasn't something that we, that we were able to rise above. We, we described it as, as controlling time. This, an even better way to describe it is that this experience of, of, of being obedient to, to Hashem, of serving Hashem, of, of marking time, it gives us freedom from time. Mm-hmm. Because, like you're pointing out, uh, it, uh, time was an, ens- an enslavement, a vehicle of enslavement that Pharaoh that Pharaoh uh, instituted. The Torah is saying, no, you are free from time. A major element of your freedom has to do with our relationship with time. And the Torah is telling us that we need to become masters of time. And even today, you know, the the, the way we are. With, uh, with the chronology of events, with, with our birth, with our lives, with our, with our inevitable deaths, our primary enslavement is really to time. Mm-hmm. And the Torah is, is beckoning to us that here, that, that before we leave Egypt, and it's the same thing today as well, on, on, on any level, we have to know that this is just an illusion. We are not enslaved to time. And that's why Hashem gives us this tremendous mitzvah here of sanctifying the new moon. And time... Because it gives us a power to transcend time. Time becomes a medium for our relationship with Hashem as opposed to something that we uh, have to live our lives according to. Uh, It becomes uh, one of the methods of communication between man and God. Uh, just as the commandments are, and that's why so many commandments are time-oriented as well, because it becomes a nexus, a, like a, a hub for the, before the interaction between man and God. And again, Kiddush HaChodesh, which means the sanctification of the new moon, is a, is a concept of, of, of empower, empowerment over time, because Moshe and Aaron, and then after them, by the way, the Sanhedrin, are given the authority to determine uh, the dates and the arrival of, of uh, the festivals and a uh, f- famous statement in the Talmud in, in Tractate Rosh Hashanah is that even if you make a mistake, even if you change the date, the heavenly bait then follows your ruling. And so this is the, this is, uh, the power of establishing uh, a time. Of course, based on the witnesses and the decisions that mm-hmm. the based in makes, it, but it's a pro- the process is given over to human beings. And this is, like you mentioned, this is part of our participation in the process of creation. On Friday night, when we say Kiddush, we've talked about this recently, and we mention as part of our Kiddush, uh, we are testifying that that God created the world in six days, and the seventh day is the Shabbat. So we're testifying to something that happened eons before we came into this world, but we can do that because we're in control of time, because we can, tr- we can somehow transcend that distance of time and, and actually it's put like ourselves a portal. in the, in a portal the, opens up and you're beyond time. And, and, and to we make become the, your real point witnesses. even stronger, that the rabbis state that whoever makes Kiddush on Friday night is made into a partner with creation, with Hashem's creating the world, which like of course... Like those movies when we were kids in school, you were there. It takes you right back to historical. Is exactly. So sequences. the question is, how could it be that, like you said, how could it be that we are now considered partners in creation of something that happened so long ago? And besides that, <laughs> I'm a partner creating the world because I'm standing here with a cup of wine. But here's the emuna aspect. It's not just that we are above time and sanctifying time and, and declaring that we are free from the shackles of of the illusions of time, but that but that we are empowered to to create with time, it's not just that, it's the emunah, it's the fact It's the fact that we are declaring that Hashem is one, that Hashem created the heavens and the earth, and that's what makes us a partner in creation. It's like threading the needle. It's like, it's like, it's like the, threading uh, the needle. It's with like, an elephant through the eye of the, you know, the needle? No, I say it's like, you know, threading the needle, just like the faith, Shabbat, it, it, all these things 
transcend whatever limitations this world imposes upon us. And it's just like we bind it all up into one, one instant of, of existence. And, and so it's not for naught that the pharaonic concept that was stressed that the teaching that Pharaoh used the element of time in his battle to, to numb the senses and to dull the sensitivity of the Israelites into, into his total dystopian slavery. When because he, if you if you feel because this and this but this is they see again this the rabbis have such tremendous insight in in these teachings because this is addressing the fact that the human condition is dependent on time and we're either slaves to it or we are able to free ourselves from from the cycle but a person who who r ruminates on the vulnerability of life on our impending death which is impending for all of us a person who gets stuck in the cycle of, of time feels so totally vulnerable and so totally victimized and becomes a total slave to to what seems to be a, a malignant cycle of uh, of despair and that, that's just so beautiful about this Torah portion is that it's beckoning to us to rise above that illusion and and the Torah is teaching us no that's the illusion what's real is beyond beyond the, uh, this feeling that you have of the of the limitation of time. You're called to go above that, and you can sanctify time, and you can actually um, even become a partner in creation through your through your observance of of Hashem's sacred seasons and time. If you recall, the very beginning of Moshe's uh, approach to Pharaoh, that uh, Pharaoh's response was to make the, the Israelite slaves start to produce, gather their own uh, uh, straw to make the, the bricks. And I think that his complaint after that, you know, was that they're not doing it fast enough. He gave them, he imposed more time uh, upon Israel. He, he created a greater weight of, of, of having to be enslaved by time. It wasn't that they weren't producing the same amount or building the same things. It was that it took them longer. And that's what almost broke their spirit. Because after that, they said to Moshe, you know, leave us alone. You just made everything worse. What was worse? That they had even less control of time. The time was an even greater shackle right. on, on their lives. And we mentioned earlier that the, the whole concept of the Passover offering was the mivchan, the, the test, the proof, the demonstration of our emunah, that we are not idolaters like the Egyptians and, and, and the holiday of the blood on the lintel and from facing the inside. And the connection in this, in this parsha, in this chapter, between the sanctification of time, the beginning of the calendar of, of Nisan, Rosh Chodesh, and the Korban Pesach, is that again, this, this feeling of uh, being controlled by time is in itself a type of idolatry. It's a type of avodah zarah because we begin to worship our fear and our sense of vulnerability. We become totally stuck in this narrow mindset of being manipulated by forces beyond our control mm -hmm. and of being victimized. And so the whole, the whole clarion call of Parshat Bo is a is a is a trumpet blast to f towards freedom. Oh, not only physical freedom from the slavery of Egypt, but but the, but this terrible psychological enslavement of time. Everything that Pharaoh represents. It's so beautiful what this parsha is really teaching us. And this is why, to this day, the uh, performing the the Passover offering, which is a commandment through all our generations, has to be done at a precise time and has to be. You have to make the time for yourselves to get to Jerusalem where you need to be, and and perform the commandment. It's not, by having to do things, uh, to perform a commandment according to a, a certain time, that's not an enslavement, that's a liberation, because that puts that avodah, that relationship with Hashem above any other, anything else in life. It's the most important thing, so when that becomes the most important thing, time is in your hands, and, and you can achieve what you need to achieve. Wow. Absolutely breathtaking. Yeah, pretty good. It's quite an experience, this Torah portion. You know what I'm really glad about? I'm glad that the show is about to end and we didn't talk about any politics this week because it's all so 
idolatrous and so makes me feel so and it's vulnerable all, to the passage of time. I was going to say, it's a, it's a waste of time. <laughs> it's throwing away this newfound freedom to talk about things which, unfortunately, uh, uh, are just, it's hard to find any light uh, emanating from, from any of these things. So stick with God. He's the reality. He's what there is in this world. He's what there is in life. He is beyond time, and uh, we can be on that journey with God if we can overcome and release the bonds of time. And this parsha was just a great lesson in the ABCs of how to do it. Am I hearing the mu music, Rabbi? I believe so, Yitzchak. Um, okay. So, our time's up. Chodesh Tov. I hope everyone has said a very that. fulfilling and wonderful and renewing month of Shabbat. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Temple Talk.